Hi everyone, um, I'm here with Henrik and Alexander. Should we just do a quick round of introductions first in case anyone doesn't know who we are? Let's, uh, let's start with Henrik if that's all right. Sure. Hi everyone, uh, I'm, my name is Henrik Eskeson and I am the uh, CEO and one of the founders of uh, Toby. And my name is Alexander Hausdell Jensen and I'm the CCO of Be My Eyes. And hello, I'm the chair today, and I'm Emma Lawson. I'm the co-founder of More Human. Uh, at More Human, we're trying to bring groups of people together by taking out the financial time and inclusion barriers to make events possible for everyone. Um, I was actually diagnosed with Parkinson's seven years ago, so I have sort of a vested interest from that point of view as well in accessibility. Um, and I was the inspiration for Microsoft's The Emma Watch, um, which helps with Parkinson's trauma. So hello, everyone, um, and welcome to my two fantastic, exciting guests. Um, we're going to talk a little bit today about inclusion and sort of all the things to do with kind of the commerciality of it. Um, I'm basically someone who's building a startup with social good at the heart of it, and it's got massive commercial potential as well. But I'm finding it quite difficult to balance the commerciality and the sort of the good it will do for people um, and how to kind of get it out into the market. So I'm kind of really interested to talk to you two about this a little bit. What's your experience been of this challenge when you come to kind of try to be taken seriously when you're creating kind of accessible inclusive tech and um, when it comes to things like investment or um how you appear to the kind of different markets you're trying to approach how have you dealt with that uh, henrik first if that's okay sure sure emma um <clears throat> i mean in toby we we actually didn't start with accessibility as sort of one of the fields that we work with we started working with what we do in Toby is we provide eye tracking technology and we do that for a lot of different fields we actually start in other fields in accessibility uh, and then um, we were early on approached by uh, some experts in the field of accessibility who saw our technology and, and recognized that there are some fantastic use cases for our technology in this field. And, and that made us very curious, but we actually approached it sort of from the beginning um, as, a, as a business opportunity for the technology that we had. And then we um, have had the opportunity and the fortune to learn all the all the fantastic things about the world of accessibility and inclusion uh, with our products and solutions. So, I think we came into it maybe a little bit easier because we we sort of had a technology and this was actually a really good use for this technology where we could do a lot of good with it. I was really intrigued by that actually to know what, which way around you'd come to do it, whether there was you know whether it was the inclusive tech first or. Um, you kind of saw a use case with more general consumer market or whether then you sort of did it the other way around. So that's really interesting to know that was the way around because it, it feels very much like you have a great focus on that inclusive inclusivity now. So yeah, I'm really interested to hear that. Thank yeah, I mean, today, today the uh, um, accessibility is the largest part of our business today. Um, so it's, it's definitely an area where there are, I mean, obviously it's a, it is a truly amazing opportunity to actually build products, build solutions that have a positive impact on people and on society. I think everybody uh, in Toby and I think everybody who does works in a similar field is really, really proud of this. Mm -hmm. But it's also, I think, really interesting to see that, that it's really today possible to, to actually develop and create fairly large businesses uh, and operations uh, that focus on providing solutions uh, to solve issues and challenges with accessibility and inclusion. I think that's a, a really interesting point is actually if you said if you spoke to someone outside of this sort of area of, of interest that actually people might not believe that that was the case mm. that actually there was enough people out there to warrant it being a big business. I think that's that's the thing people sometimes don't really understand. That yeah, I, I, mean, I think you're right. That's my experience as well. Just talking to investors, for instance, you have to give them some numbers mm. uh, to actually make them understand that that in a global world, I mean, this part, part of this is that today, all businesses can be global. So even though maybe it's a relatively small percentage of a population that has a particular special need, when you can address a business globally on, on the planet, there's still a lot of people with that particular need. Mm. Yeah, it's very true. Um, it's something I've noticed quite interestingly with them, um, Be My Eyes, Alexander, that actually they've won a lot of awards. And I noticed kind of early on in the sort of earlier days, I noticed they were kind of maybe more sort of accessibility or kind of health related awards and those have become more sort of mainstream over the years you've kind of you're actually winning awards that are just good tech or just good solutions i wonder how that must feel right no that that feels great and i think a little opposite to uh, henrik we started out with accessibility 
as the core of what we're doing. The purpose was at the core. And because what we're doing is like offering this free service that allows people who are blind or low vision to lead more independent lives uh, by connecting to volunteers on one side and then companies on the other. And one thing that we kind of wanted to change pretty early on was that it seems that there was such a difference between purpose and profit. And we, we kind of want to uh, change that perspective a little bit and say, no, this is actually about the interplay between purpose and profit. It's the, that it's two factors that accelerate each other, not slow each other down. Mm -hmm. So it's, um, uh, and I think that's also reflected in like what you just mentioned, um, but where our focus in the, in the beginning was very much focused on, on, on our purpose and providing access to them. But we realized to do that, we really need the profits. Um, and the other way around, so it can't be at the expense of uh, one of these two, and the, the, that kind of has to be a um, an interplay. The more profits, the more purpose. The more purpose, purpose, the more profits. Mm -hmm. um, and that's kind of been our model and how we have developed. That's that's fascinating, actually. I think that's a really good, really good point about that kind of link. And I think a lot of people separate the two out, and even with maybe very different audiences or very different sort of needs. Um, so yeah, that's really that's that's really interesting. Um, I mean, Henrik, you've been, you've been, Toby's been going since 2001. What was there in the way of competition back in 2001 for this sort of thing? And how much yeah, has it changed uh, since then? Uh, eye tracking technology was pretty much science fiction back in 2001. <laughs> um, um, and of course, we thought that we invented this kind of technology ourselves. It, we later found out that others had invented it before us. Um, so there was actually uh, there was actually competition in the technology field, but it was actually mainly used in very niche areas in psychology and neurology research, for instance. Um, and when we started Toby, our sort of idea from the beginning was we want to revolutionize the world by putting eye tracking technology into every computer and bring this to consumer mass market and, and change the way all of us interact with technology which was, of course, 90 years ago, a totally crazy and naive uh, uh, idea, um, which wasn't at all possible at the time. But uh, actually, it's funny because today we're coming back today. Today, we're working a lot with bringing this technology into consumer mass market. But we, of course, had to find these early applications that could actually make use of this technology, even when it was much less mature. It was more expensive. It was it maybe didn't work perfectly. It, it was kind of big and clunky. Um, um, and this is also where we, after working on it for a few years and building up um, our first business uh, with the technology was actually uh, providing solutions to researchers to understand behavior using eye tracking. Mm. But then again, um, the accessibility field has been definitely one of those areas that has um, been a, a natural early adopter market for a technology like this. And it's been an opportunity for us to evolve and grow as a company, but also for the technology to mature and develop to a point where actually today it is becoming applicable to all of us in consumer devices. Definitely. And I can see some kind of some similarities there between sort of be my eyes as well with the fact that actually the sort of technology that maybe was designed for one thing, but it actually has multiple uses. I think that's the best kind of technology, isn't it, really, when you can kind of there's so many different routes to market with it, so many different people you can help and so many different kind of outcomes. Because I mean, I'm sure there's probably other uses for being my eyes as well as, as what it's actually used for currently. Yeah, I think so. It's, um, I, I think this model of micro volunteering, of connecting people who need assistance with people who can provide that assistance. Uh, our focus is mainly on uh, blindness, colorblind, uh, low vision, dyslexia, uh, all visual impairments. Uh, but it, I mean, the technology and the model can basically be used to connect uh, car enthusiasts with each other because one uh, part of the community has some knowledge and the other one needs that knowledge so it's uh, connecting them on like a micro micro volunteering basis is super super interesting model i think alex can't you take it would it be okay to just explain how the business model work because we we mentioned that briefly before and i thought that was really interesting to just understand your business model absolutely so when we started we had no idea how to make BMIS into a sustainable thing. Um, we launched this um, mobile app connecting our blind users with volunteers only. And from day one, we just realized the money is not in charging the users because we don't want to 
put up any barriers to using the application. It has to be free. And it's our responsibility to figure out how are we going to make this into a sustainable thing? How are we able to grow, provide a quality service and all these things without charging our users, without putting ads in front of our users? And to be honest, it took quite a while uh, to crack the nut um, because we didn't want to grab any of these low hanging fruits. And what inspired our, our business model and our approach to like this, deciding which monetization strategy to go with was, was um, this postcard. Um, I don't know if it's the same where you're based, but uh, in Denmark, at least, uh, when you go into a cafe, you have these like free postcards that you can grab and it's from companies sponsoring all kinds of different things. Uh, and I grabbed one of these postcards and on it, it says, because only, by, because only everybody wins when nobody loses. <laughs> and we're like, that sounds nice. That, sh that should be our design sentence. This is the, the sentence that we should use when figuring out how to monetize. And so a few years goes on and we realize all of a sudden that our volunteering network is great for so many different things. But for some, sometimes you just need to talk to an expert. Sometimes you, you need to talk to a company directly. So we created what we call specialized help where that allows companies and organizations to connect with the low vision community uh, through the Be My Eyes app. So it's like accessible customer support through live video. And Microsoft was the first company to join and they were followed by Google and um, Procter and & Gamble and some banks and a lot of other big, big companies in this year, uh, pharmacies, voting, COVID testing, all kinds of different organizations are there to support the community. The companies they pay to provide the service to the community, this is still completely free. And we're really excited about that because it really follows our mantra if, uh, because no one is losing here. The, uh, the users are able to get the support that they need. The companies are able to provide an accessible support to, the, to this community of millions and millions and millions of people. And we're able to provide a, a, a free service and build a sustainable business. So that's kind of how we have gotten to, to monetization. So as I said in the beginning, we started out with like pure like purpose, accessibility is all that matters, but realizing we need to figure out how to make this just in, mm -hmm. into a sustainable way. In a, makes, in a way that makes sense to the community. I think that's the biggest challenge, isn't it? I mean, I, we often find sort of with more human because we're doing what is considered something good. Um, people expect us to either do it for free. We want to do it for as free as possible. We don't want to have to charge for as much of it as possible, but actually to keep something sustainable and to offer a great service, you often need to charge or you need to, to make it someone's priority. You need to pay them to do a job. So it's, it's, it's quite a difficult kind of line to tread, I think sometimes to, to when people kind of expect things that are for good to be for free and and it's kind of trying to balance that kind of commerciality with the and how you can keep things going for people i think that the lineup of this uh, of of of, of TechShare pro this year with all of these industry leaders from huge 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 companies where accessibility is such a high priority mm. really shows that accessibility and purpose and doing the right thing goes hand in hand with the creating sustainable big business and it's actually a way to get there so i'm i'm really like hopeful for the future and um, because like there's so many smaller companies getting involved but also that it's such a high priority for all of the for the biggest companies in the world that's really nice yeah i think that's a really really excellent point i mean it's becoming a higher priority i think for a while it felt like it was a priority for sort of corporate social responsibility kind of purposes to say that people were doing it but actually it feels like it's actually on the agenda properly now and that actually products are being built with people in mind a lot more I think that's something we have in common between our sort of three businesses is the fact that actually humans are very much at the heart and technology is sort of a supporting role I mean if you look at um more human we're basically using technology to bring groups of people together and um, so it's kind of I guess spending more time with other humans because of the support of technology. Um, whereas with Toby, it's kind of humans having the basic right of communication with other humans by using technology. And being my eyes is humans helping humans by technology. So it's sort of, I think there's some interesting kind of the balance between what roles a human takes and what roles the technology takes in any relationship is, is it's quite important in all our businesses, I think. I think it's actually part of a, almost like a meta trend that if you go back 20, 30 years ago, technology was kind of clunky and it was expected that we human beings, we figured out how to use the technology and 
and and if we couldn't do it right we were kind of stupid or something uh whereas i think today when um when you're in like the big corporations that actually provide products or services, et cetera, based on technology, it's, it's actually what's winning. The, the, the companies that are winning are not the ones that can develop a technology with the most horsepower, but the one who's winning is actually the one who can develop the best user experience and mm -hmm. the most human user experience. Yeah. And who's actually best at sort of augmenting and enabling, enabling in us as human beings in different ways. And I think in that part of well, as well, it's not, of course, then enabling just a few of us or some of us, but actually all of us, no matter what shape and color and capability and, and et cetera, we come into. And I think it is actually, it is truly genuinely becoming important also for these very large corporations. Companies like, for instance, take a Microsoft or a Google, they, they need to address very large corporations with all of the diver, diverse workforces that they have with their tools. And they need to address schools and be, sort of have solutions that are applicable and useful, usable by all sorts of children in these schools and all sorts of teachers in these schools. So if they actually want to be relevant with their products, they have to be inclusive and accessible today. Definitely. Yeah. And I think this is just a sort of an inevitable part of, of an evolution of mankind in, in many ways, actually. I, I, as someone with a condition, I kind of feel like it's my sort of superpower in a way. And I, I feel like something like Parkinson's is a real difficult kind of challenge because there's so many um, symptoms, but also side effects of the medication. And I feel like almost I'm sort of the, the perfect user tester because actually I have so many symptoms that span other, span other products um, that I can kind of test many things and be quite useful in that sense. But um, I think, yeah, involving, involving kind of people is, is just such a huge part of, of everything everyone does nowadays. It's become, it used to be a buzzword, it used to be a kind of a, a trend, but I think actually people have realized if you're not designing for the people with the biggest challenges then you know you're not really designing for a massive group that, that kind of group of people is considered an important group now and, and an important part of the market which is well, becoming more so like that which is great yeah and i think what well, just just building on that emma i think that when we talk about that group that is of course like right now i think 15 percent about a billion people and mm. one out of seven which is of course a huge 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 number but that's also like that's the like the snapshot of what it's what it is like right now <laughs> we say that like there are people with accessibility needs, people mm -hmm. with disabilities, and then there are those who haven't experienced theirs yet. And I think that sentence is, is like so powerful because it means that we will all need these technologies at some point. Mm -hmm. So as a business, I really don't understand why we don't design, even if we strip away all of the uh, compassionate arguments for investing in accessibility if it's only like a super selfish de decision i don't see why it's not the easiest decision to make to make mm -hmm. it more accessible and inclusive because it's going to affect ourselves at the end of the day and um, and luckily like more and more companies as we all agree on are starting to focus more and more on this group being at the end of the day probably all of us and um, and i think if the the ones who are not they're really, I think they're gonna lose. And I think uh, it's not designing, designing in an inaccessible way, it's not designing for the future. So if I was an investor, if I was someone who is putting money in the market, I would go for the companies that invest in building technologies and solutions for the future. Um, and that's why I think accessibility is becoming such a, more than the right thing to do. It's the right thing to do also for, from a business standpoint. Very, really good point. And I think, I mean, who ever said I don't want this, this because it's too accessible? Who ever, ever said that? I mean, you, the accessible design, I remember I'm a graphic designer as well. And I remember sort of maybe sort of 10 years or so ago, accessible design was something I didn't want to have to do because it looks so ugly. And actually designing products and things like that have always been a challenge to make them kind of beautiful or things that people would actually want to covet, but actually at the same time functional. And I think the tech has really come on so that actually you can be proud of something and kind of and own it and it feel not like a clunky piece of sort of you know that sort of nhs gray kind of blue color that plastic things that used to be kind of things used to be made of in the past it's, everything's kind of works better and looks better and actually something that you want to own and i think who doesn't like something that's successful and works well i mean even if you have no challenges yet as you're saying 
you may have challenges before. I remember seeing a talk by Hector uh, Minto a num number of years ago, where he said uh, all of us at some point are disabled. You know, whether it's we're holding our child while we're doing something else, that's you know one arm that's not free, you've got, and you've got one arm left to use. And I think you know, it's it's a really interesting point that actually you don't know what you're going to face in your future. You know, no one really knows. And I think at some point we will have challenges that we need that little bit of help, a bit more accessibility help, don't we? Really. Yeah, the field, um, the field that we are in uh, on the accessibility side um, is using eye, con eye tracking through eye controlled computers, which enables people with a speech impairment to communicate effectively. And this is often referred to as AAC or augmentative and alternative communication. And that's an interesting term, augmentative and alternative mm -hmm. communication, because all of us can be augmented in our ability to communicate uh, in different ways. So. Uh, exactly as you say, I mean, and it, one way to put it is we are all disabled at some part in our life. Yes, we probably are in certain situations or at some stage of life, but it's also the fact that we can all benefit from technology that is just more accessible, that is just so intuitive or so it helps us become an even better version of ourselves and actually empowering us as human beings to do more, to create more, etc. And then, yes, maybe the the Delta benefit is larger for a person with a disability, but the benefit can still exist for all of us as well. And I think this is, this is very much what we see when we actually sort of, again, have sort of fertilized this technology in, a, in, in, a, in the accessibility field, but we can take some of those benefits and provide them to everyone. I mean, that's, that transition is really interesting. <clears throat> yeah, that's a really good point. Um... I mean, I'd love to kind of to ask you for some advice, really. So what would you both, if you could give me advice as someone starting out on this journey, what would you say is the biggest thing you've learned sort of during your time in this in this area, sort of how to kind of grab people's attention, how to make people believe that it's a serious thing, that, that's a big business and, and things like that. How have you done that? How have you managed that? Um, I would say one thing that remember that as I don't need to convince you Emma but that accessibility is not a niche and I think that was one of the first things that we were struggling with when trying to like raise money to build out the application and doing all these things a lot of people were like we don't know any people who are blind or have low vision mm -hmm. so like is, is there you know a market for this so I think that's the first one really understanding how to position this as a great market opportunity and um, i'll say the second one is like staying really true to what like you are you are moral codex and um, i think that one of the th things that we did um one of the hardest decisions that we made that was probably one of the best decisions that we made was to keep the app completely free and um, mm -hmm. i can tell you that running a mobile application for several years without having any idea how you're going to make money mm. it's not the easiest thing in the world because when you talk to an investor they'll probably ask you so how is this gonna how's this gonna work and we're like actually we have no idea but we're confident that we're gonna figure it out don't worry um, and so and that was only because we were like we don't want to we don't want to put up many too many barriers to um, getting this technology in the hands of people mm. so and that's maybe the main thing is I think that an accessibility tool or an assistive technology tool is only accessible if it's also financially accessible. That's a really good point. And that can be difficult to figure out a model that really works. Um, but being really patient and really um, trying not to pick the low-hanging fruits because I think that's going to harm your long-term um, long goals. That's really, really good advice. Thank you. <laughs> I mean, Henrik, 19 years ago, how, how did you get into this? How did this happen? I mean, there wasn't really that much tech around sort of at that time. How did, I mean, you must have learned so much over that period of time. Oh, absolutely. If I may tie to your previous question, like I just want to chime in on what Alex said. I think one of the biggest uh, sort of things uh, or maybe advice is be persistent. Um, uh, everyone starting a new business is met by a lot of skeptics uh, and uh, we were definitely met by a lot of skeptics because our ideas were pretty crazy from the beginning. 
Um, and you just have to, if you believe in what you're doing, you just have to be persistent and you might have to bang your head against the wall quite a few times. I don't think that's specific for doing it in the accessibility field. I think that goes for any kind of entrepreneurship, et cetera. And it, it's just the same thing really. And I actually remember when we started reaching out to some sales partners and resellers for our products in the accessibility field, they who are, were already experts in the field, they said, no, oh, I don't think there is a market for this. And we're like, yeah, we think that there is actually, because this is doing something really good for people. So keep on being stubborn. Um, and I sometimes say that, that if you're gonna succeed as an entrepreneur, you probably need to have some level of brains. Uh, you need to have an immense amount of stubbornness, but you also need to be probably kind of naive because if you actually understood how difficult it was going to be, <laughs> you would never dare to do it in the first place. I'm going to try and rebrand stubborn as a positive. I think stubborn is a really positive quality in kind of any environment. So I think it's often sold as a negative, but I think stubborn is something that gets people through life a lot yeah, of the time. So. I think it does. So, um, sorry, so I've interjected the other question, um, but actually I, I've kind of, we've got to end up in a little while, but um, we, at the beginning uh, we were asked to describe ourselves for the people that can't actually see us, and I got to mention that, so I know it's going to be at the end now, but um, if we could just describe ourselves so people can get a sense of who they've been listening to, that would be great. So I'm Emma, I have pink hair, and I have Parkinson's, and that pretty much sums me up, I think, um, uh, and I've got a neck brace on because I've hurt my neck, so um, Sorry to describe this at the end rather than the beginning. And I hope you, I wonder what you imagined us to be like <laughs> when you couldn't see us. If you two wouldn't mind just describing yourself, that'd be fantastic, thank you. All right, so uh, Henrik here, I am, uh, I'm short, I have no hair uh, and I have a big smile on my face because I enjoy talking to you. <laughs> and my name is Alexander and I am, um, I have a big like swirl in my hair and right in the front. <laughs> uh, in, in Danish, it's called a cowlick. I don't even know what it's called in there. <laughs> it's called a cowlick still as well, in, I think. In, in English, but it's, imagine like a big cowlick you in the face and you end up with one of these <laughs> really things in the, in the forehead. Great description. Thank you, guys. Um, so we've got a couple of minutes left. I don't know if there's anything you guys want to kind of talk about within that two minutes before we kind of have to finish up. But um, um, I think one, um, well, yep, right, go you, go, you go, Alex. I just as, as a final, like, um, uh, thanks for, for your time. Uh, I just want to invite anyone who, um, anyone into the Be Minds community, whether you're blind uh, or low vision and you need a free tool, or if you are just someone who would like to volunteer, feel free to sign up among, alongside about four and a half million other volunteers who are using it right now. Or if you work for a company that is looking to support your blind and low vision customers in a better way, uh, feel free to check out Be My Eyes and join the community. Fantastic, thank you. And sorry, did you want to say something, Henrik, as well? No, I can't say a thing. Um, <laughs> to all those uh, engineers who might be uh, uh, listening in or, or one, um, thinking about being an entrepreneur or something, um, do something exciting in this field. There's so many opportunities to innovate, whether it's technology or businesses, et cetera. So do it in this area. Uh, that's my advice. Fantastic. Thank you, guys.